Hey, this is Dan from MSS Enduralis. Welcome to the channel. You don't know anything about what's coming. So there are a number of events that could create a situation in the cities where civil unrest would be a very high probability. And I think that those who can and those who understand need to take advantage of the opportunity when these winds of strife are not blowing to move their families out. I'll tell you something else about this. It's just plain fun. When you're looking at the challenge of what do I have to do so that I'm independent of the system? But I think that you have to have, um, you would have to have some um, like farming skills. You should be out on your own little piece of land or with several friends or something and uh, raise your own food, have your own uh, fruit trees and have your, you know, your water system and uh, how you're going to get along if all these uh, utilities are cut off, you know. The banking situation when this thing all falls through, we're going to be, we're going to have to be ingenious in making things work and dependent upon God. Because when this thing falls through, there won't be anything to rely on. Uh, I read a book one time that said that there, when this, when this thing happens to this country, all financial support will be taken away from us. There'll be no financial support. We have to learn how to live without money. And uh, the guy in the country is the one who's gonna do this. People in the city are gonna be cutting each other's throats. Well, there are cut throats now, you know. <laughs> but uh, uh, your garden in the city is not gonna be yours, it's gonna be everybody's. So we'll be like kings and queens living out in the country where we can have a garden to supply our family's needs. It says here, uh, warning, this book is the property of the United States government. It is unlawful to sell it to any other person or to use it or permit anyone else to use it except to obtain ration goods in accordance with regulations of the Office of Price Administration. Cooperate with your local salvage committee. I don't believe this is over. I believe that in the future, because what I saw happen in Katrina, in New Orleans with Katrina, I think that was a wake up call to people that live in the cities. Those that have their eyes open and are listening and maybe reading their Bible will understand what is gonna happen in these cities. Things are gonna happen that are gonna be a lot worse than what happened in New Orleans. Uh, I believe we'll go back to rationing of some kind and uh, that, at that time uh, I would want to be living in the country with fruit trees and a garden and have my, uh, my uh, food and, and water sure. So I think that provident people who understand who have a responsibility to their families will be, will be looking more and more to getting out of the city and it's a huge challenge. There's no exhilaration like the exhilaration of meeting and overcoming a big challenge. You stop and think about, gee, what do I need to do so that I can be independent out there? That, 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 that if the world fell apart, it really wouldn't matter for me and my family. That's really an interesting challenge. By the way, uh, one other reason for doing this is it's a really patriotic thing to do. Because for all of our citizens who aren't dependent on the state when an emergency happens, we're going to be stronger and stronger, aren't we? So as a member of Congress, I'm concerned. I would like everybody to do this. I would like everybody to have a year's supply of food. I'd like everybody uh, to, to have some plans so that they can make do if, if any one of these emergencies occurs. But it's going to be easier to do that. And you'll avoid the problems of civil unrest if you're out of the cities and out in the country. We need to get out.
A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. Are we prepared to meet it? Many feel that a viable solution to hard economic times includes relocating to the city. But not everyone is moving into town these days. A counter-migration out of the cities is now in full swing. Not of the same magnitude that has populated them during the last century, but a growing migration nonetheless. What could have precipitated this? The reasons are as many and varied as the people who have been impacted by them. They come from all walks of life, but their goal is the same, looking for a better way to live, getting back to their roots. While difficult times surround us on every hand, they are seeking to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. This is their story. Uh, we bought the property here in the uh, fall of 1980. And that same fall, we uh, built the cabin. As a matter of fact, we started building the cabin before we closed on the property. At that time, it was solid woods here. There was no lake in, and we had to walk through a little path kind of to get down here. And most of the lumber was, uh, was carried down on a cart. It was a very dry year. We didn't know that. Uh, but it was a very dry year, and we had a little trailer we pulled behind the car to bring the material in. The next year, and for 10 years after that, you couldn't drive in because it was very wet. Now, of course, we have a good stone road coming in. When we first came to the mountain here and preparing to build our house, we were uh, staying in a tent. And uh, I noted that, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had a little cabin to stay in rather than a tent? I originally hadn't planned on one quite this large, but that's how it came out. When I built this in uh, 1980, it cost just about $1,000 uh, to build a cabin. And it was, it was livable. We lived in here for uh, uh, quite a while, really. And then we built our house, and uh, the cabin was kind of uh, left deserted, and the mice moved in, and uh, it was a question of whether we would uh, continue to maintain the cabin or simply tear it down. And then my wife said, gee, why don't we re uh, store or rehab the cabin? And so we did that. It's really a very interesting challenge to, uh, to try and build as much livability as you can into something as small as this. This is uh, 16 by 20 feet, and it will sleep uh, 10 people, every one of them uh, uh, in a bed. Uh, one of the beds is here. Uh, it's a, uh, the kind of a thing that you have in a motor home, a bit larger than you have in a motor home. And the table goes down to form the uh, bottom of the bed and the cushions slide out. And so you have a, a pretty much a full-size uh, bed there. Uh, the center, of course, in any cabin like this is the, is, is the cook stove. And you see that here. And as they say, it does uh, four things for you. It uh, cooks your food and it bakes your bread and it warms your house and it heats your water. In a moment, we'll go around to the other side so we can see how it heats your water. Of course, in the summertime, even here on the mountain where it's quite cool and you don't need air conditioning, you still don't want a, a fire in your stove. And so we have a little propane stove here. As long as propane is available, why we will uh, do our cooking in the summertime on that propane stove. And then the cabinet under it is a 20 pound cylinder, which should pretty much last you uh, quite a long while in the summertime with the limited cooking that, uh, uh, that we, you would do. Uh, let's walk around to the corner here and, uh, and see the, the um, uh, heating system. Uh, there is in, this, in the uh, firebox in the stove here, uh, there is a uh, stainless steel uh, U-tube. And you can see the stainless steel U-tube here. And uh, this is called a thermosiphon system. And out the back of the stove are two pipes. Uh, one is the uh, bottom of it, which brings the cold water in. And the other is the top of it, where the hot water runs out. This is the cold water. This is the hot water. And you can feel a big, big difference in temperature. And hot water is uh, lighter, and it rises. And cold water is dense, and it, and it falls 
and there's a tank upstairs, which we'll look at in a few moments, and that stores the, uh, the hot water. Now it does not have a cover on it, so we can see how the tank works. You could either leave it uncovered if you want the heat up there, or if you want to maintain more hot water, you would put covers on the tank, and we have two covers here to put on the tank. The water system in the house is this um, a special kind of a, uh, of a uh, cistern pump. If we open this valve and uh, close this one, then we're pumping uh, out of a spring, which is under the house here, under the cabin. And if we close this valve and open this one, we're now pumping up to a storage tank in the attic through this hose. And when the storage tank is full, it's not quite full now, but when the storage tank is full, why the excess water will run out here and you know the storage tank is full. So a little exercise in the morning and then you have running water uh, all the rest of the day. Because uh, we're pumping water up, uh, a bit of force is needed, uh, we built a, uh, a little extension here that we can put on to the, uh, uh, that, where you can pump more easily. And now you've got some leverage and so you can easily pump the water up to the storage tank which is up in the uh, gable, right up in the very top of the, uh, 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 of the cabin here. Uh, there's a little refrigerator here. Be very careful uh, in refrigeration uh, when you're out in the woods like this with, with power that you're getting from the sun or from a wind machine. And we looked and looked until we found one that had a very high efficiency. It's very small. It's very interesting how small a refrigerator you can get by with. If you think about your refrigerator at home, they really ought to make refrigerators. They're only about six or eight inches deep because that first six or eight inches that you use and the rest of it, you just store food in it until it gets old enough that you have a clear conscience and you can throw it out. <laughs> so with a small refrigerator like this, you don't have that problem because everything in it is, is, is going to be usable because it's small. If you plan your meals, you won't have all that much left over, and so a refrigerator that size will serve quite adequately. Let's take a look next at the uh, Murphy bed here. This doesn't have the springs and stuff in it, but it's light enough that it doesn't matter. It's easily uh, manageable. Well, maybe we ought to go upstairs. To get upstairs, there's no stairway here. Uh, there's a ladder on each end because there's a bedroom on each end and you'd like some privacy. Uh, I'd like first to uh, look at the water system here. Uh, this is the uh, hot water storage tank. As I put my hand on it, I can barely hold my hand on it. We've had a muted fire down there that will get so hot you can't hold your hand on it. Now we have two blankets that you can put around that, the regular blankets for insulating around your hot water heater. If it's cold wintertime, you want heat upstairs here, you might not want the blankets on it. They easily come on and off. Just leave this here. Now it's a big radiator. Be assured that that stove will produce more hot water than you need. As a matter of fact, you can have a luxury bath every night and you still will have hot water left over. Uh, the pressure for the system is this uh, uh, tank uh, right above us here. And uh, the cabin was just large enough I can get the tank in and walk under it, as you can see. And this you fill by uh, pumping up from the, uh, uh, from the kitchen sink down there with that unique kind of a uh, cistern pump that we have down there, which is also a force pump. I also have in the basement, which we'll go into a little later, an uh, electric pump down there. But I'll tell you, it's very comforting to know that, that you can live well without electricity because it might not always be there. And uh, so we have the force pump down there, and I have not used the electric pump yet to fill the system. Uh, let's look at the beds here. A uh, four can sleep. We built this for our sons, and their uh, uh, friends would come down with them, and so we can sleep one here, and we can sleep two in the bed under it, and we can sleep one in the bed over here. So you can sleep a uh, four here. I want to show you something very unique about under the bed. And let me pull this out. Oh, those are the two blankets for the... Uh, so, but notice how big that drawer is. There's no dressers here, but you have more space in these drawers than you would have in dressers because there are three drawers under this one. And if I pull the drawer out from the other side, that drawer will be even longer. See how deep the drawer is. It goes back still further than this. So there's more storage space under these beds than you would have with conventional uh, dressers in a, uh, in a bedroom. 
in a small cabin like this, uh, very much like a motor home, you've got to make sure that you use all available space as efficiently uh, as you can. We also have a half bath up here. Uh, the bedroom here was the bedroom that we stayed in for a number of years while we built the house. And it has a larger than the standard uh, bed here. It uh, is as wide and a bit longer than a standard bed. I just want to show you again one of these enormous drawers underneath. In addition to the shelves there for storing things, we have these drawers. And it pulls out and out and out. See how large the drawer is. These have a very interesting, it's like um, uh, Teflon nylon material under the drawer. There are no slides, but it really slides quite easily. And you can feel the air coming out because it fits in a pretty tight box. You can feel the air coming out as you shut the door. But it opens and shuts very easily. Uh, this is where you come up. As you see, it takes no floor space. I'm walking here on, on the uh, little trap door. You open that up, and uh, uh, there is the ladder uh, that goes downstairs. Uh, our pioneers frequently had in their house a, a secret place that it wasn't obvious it was there. It wasn't intended that our uh, cellar, our basement, would be that way, but it turned out that way. If you uh, move this wood box back like this and set this kindling box on top of it and uh, move the rug, move the rug, we, we will open up into the basement. The house is built over a spring, and uh, you'll see the kind of a basement floor that we put in to accommodate that. Let me go down now into the basement and turn the light on, and then we will move down into the basement so we can see what's there. We're now down in the basement. I'd first like to note that wherever you're building over anything is going to be damp, always use treated wood. It has two advantages. One is it's treated and it won't rot. The second advantage is, in the east at least, it's always a southern yellow pine, which is a very tough wood, so you're going to get more strength from the same size board. So this is all treated. We also have a rigid insulation here, which serves somewhat as a, a vapor barrier, because it's going to be moist down here. Uh, if you're going to use this as a root cellar, you want it moist. And here you see some shells where you could use this as a, as a root cellar. Since I dug all of this out by hand, I simply dug down as far as what's convenient and then put shelves in. It's a whole lot easier to store things on a shelf than it is the floor anyway. You're not, you're not uh, uh, leaning over to pick it off of the floor. This is interesting here. There was a stump here, and it was going to be very difficult to get the uh, roots out, and so I just built around it. The black that you see there is 20 mil uh, PVC, and this is a pond liner or swimming pool liner, and I put this here to protect the spring because we're built over a spring. You can see electric pump back there that I mentioned earlier. I've never used that pump. I always simply use the hand pump. And you can see there the uh, hose going up uh, uh, for the hand pump. By the way, at the bottom, of, uh, I have a one-way valve down in the spring. So to uh, drain the system, you'll see a little a silcock there. And in the, when it's going to freeze, I simply put a bucket under that and I'd get out maybe a quart or so of water that runs out of that hose up to the, uh, uh, up to the pump. Um, this can be conveniently used as a, as a root cellar. Uh, we protect the spring by putting the, uh, the uh, PVC over it. And then to protect the VV PVC, this floor is just uh, loose laid, uh, uh, half inch uh, treated plywood. Uh, if you build, if you have the luxury of having a spring above you, by all means capture that spring and have automatic gravity flow. We didn't have that option here because the spring was right down here where we were building our cabin. So we did the next best thing. We built the cabin over the spring. And originally we had some, a simple little uh, cistern pump and uh, they cost, well, I bought one uh, for $19.95 recently. If you buy them on sale, they're really very cheap. If you're not pumping it up to a, to a tank like we have in the attic, they serve very well and uh, you simply pour a little water in them and they are kind of self-priming and you can pump out. And when we lived in the cabin here, that's what, uh, uh, that's what we, uh, we used. Uh, but if you can't have gravity flow, which is certainly desirable, capture the spring above you, flow down by gravity, then you automatically have, have pressure. 
uh, do the next best thing, build over the spring. And what we do here is so that you have the convenience of running water uh, for, the, for your day. After the inconvenience of having to pump it up in the morning, uh, we simply have that tank, which you saw earlier up in the attic, which stores the water and then everything runs by gravity from that. So during the day when you're using it, it's, a, you know, it, it's, it's gravity flow and it's you simply turn the faucet on, the water comes out. You're not gonna get the explosive pressures that you have in the city where you're running 60, 80 pounds pressure. Here we're running, what, that's a half pound per foot and we're five feet, so we have two and a half pounds pressure. But uh, the water does flow and you can take a shower and you do get enough water to wash your hands and, 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 and so forth. By the way, if you aren't familiar with the root cellaring, uh, you really do need to become familiar with that. Our forefathers used that extensively uh, you go uh, to Europe today, you go to Russia particularly, and they just don't trust the system. And they aren't sure that there's going to be food on the shelves all winter. And so whether you're rich or you're poor, you probably have a dacha. And uh, you go outside the city, and if you uh, have some means, you will have a nice summer home there, but you will grow your garden there. And if you're poor, you'll have something there that's not much bigger than, a, than what the two by four feet in which you store your hand garden tools. But everybody that I know in Russia has a dacha and they raise their food and they use root cellars and they pickle it and they dry it. There are all sorts of techniques you can use to preserve your food. We don't really think of those today because it's so convenient to go to the supermarket. But you know, you're planning because the supermarket may not always be there. And we'll show you a little later a root cellar that's built into one of the other homes here uh, 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 on the lake, and you'll see the potatoes that were put in there last fall, they come out this spring, not even a sprout on them. And uh, nobody was living in the house all winter, the house is just being built, but yet the potatoes were perfectly, in fact, you can plant them. You never need to buy seed potatoes. Our forefathers didn't buy seed potatoes, there weren't any to buy. They kept their potatoes in a root cellar, and when spring came, there were the potatoes, and they, they, they could go out and plant them. So it's a self-perpetuating kind of thing. And what you really need to do is to plan so that in an emergency, you could do that. It may be convenient to go to the store and buy the seed potatoes, but you know, you will always have next spring, if you have a root cellar, you, have, you will have potatoes which will have made it through the winter which you can use for seed potatoes the next spring. This is the downstairs bathroom. This bathroom is quite small because it's in a cabin which is only 16 by 20 feet. On this end is a, uh, a lavatory. Uh, the tub is obviously uh, recycled from a motor home. Okay, let's take a look now at the uh, rest of the accessories of the cabin. Um, obviously you need a wood supply and we have uh, designed the wood supply so that it is accessible without going uh, outside. A little greenhouse on the cabin here with the windows facing south. And there are three cords of wood stored here. And that three cords of wood uh, should be more than enough to last for a full season uh, in heating in the cabin. And then next is a little shop here. And it's amazing how uh, convenient uh, and necessary a little shop is. This is really very rudimentary. It has just the basic uh, uh, economical skill saw and a sliding uh, uh, miter saw, a uh, vise and a uh, uh, grinder. And the last little thing I need in here is a simple drill press. Uh, and then next is a, uh, is a barn in which one time we had uh, uh, chickens and, uh, and uh, uh, goats. Uh, now it's primarily uh, uh, storage. In the wintertime, it's very inconvenient to go outside to get wood, which is covered with snow and ice. It's very nice to have it under cover. It's even nicer if you don't have to walk outside to get it. So something which is attached to your cabin that has the wood in it with a covered walkway to get in the door is very convenient. And then um, when you have something like this, there's not only do you need the shop when you're building it, but there are always things you will need to do, and a simple shop set up like this will pay for itself many, many times over. As you can see from the construction here, very little expense was involved in this. Matter of fact, this barn is built out of local rough sawn lumber. Uh, it's built out of white pine. It may seem strange to build a building out of white pine, but it's a very common material here, here in the mountains, and uh, so this came from a local sawmill. 
Of course, anything that touches the dirt is treated wood. The white pine will rot in a couple of years if it touches dirt. So make sure that anything that touches dirt is treated wood.